126, and we're down to talking about Ali Debug down here. And I'll do a couple demos this time, and next time I'll do a bunch of demos and no lecture from the book to get caught up on the demos because the demos have been a bit behind. So that's my plan. So let me get my slides, which I may have to download. Let's see. 126. Yep, all right, I got to download it. Uh, chapter 9, there it is. Okay. And I think that'll do. Let me make it fit the screen a little better. There, all right. So, uh, we talked about general debuggers last time, and the main one that we're gonna use is Ollie Debug, or the uh, essentially identical product immunity. It's been around for a long time, and it was used to cheat on Windows games, and to develop exploits, and it makes it fun and easy. So, uh, the source code was purchased and rebranded as Immunity, which is the living, currently under development version of the same thing. There are also new open source products called X32 Debug and X64 Debug, which are even more modern probably, but they all have essentially the same interface and they all work almost exactly the same way. So, um, you can load EXEs in it directly and run them, of course, or you can even load DILs in it. Now, if you're running to load DILs in it, it will run a program to launch the DIL. The DIL can't run directly. And you can also attach to a running process. So this is the same stuff we talked about before for general. And so you can just open an EXE and you can, it'll stop at the entry point um, if it can, or find the entry point one way or another, and stop. Rather than running the program, it'll stop so you can examine it. You can attach to a running process. It will break in and pause the running process. So you can, um, if you catch it in a library, which is likely, should have pay there. Whoops, all right, that didn't help. Anyway, um, then you can set a breakpoint on uh, access to the code section to get to the interesting code. That's one way to do it. You can also run to user code, which we'll see. All right, so control F2 reloads the current executable and F2 sets a breakpoint. These are common tricks. You get used to these key presses, they help. You can do everything from the menu too, but you get used to the key presses for the common things. And let me get the chat window open. Okay, good, no comments in the chat yet. All right, so the interface. I talked about it briefly last time, and uh, let me just bring it up live here. We're gonna do some demos anyway. So here's my Procmon, and that's not right. Let me get my console there. See if it's going to work or if I have to restart it. Oh, it's going to work. Okay. Good. Well, I thought it was going to work. Okay. And uh, the stream only sees the top three quarters of the screen, but that's all right. I'll just drag windows up there as necessary. So let me launch Ollie. There we go. All right. And let's open. Uh, I'll just oh, I'll open this thing. Zero, zero, zero. That's a good one. All right, so now you get four panes, and let me resize it so it fits in the viewable part for the remote viewers, or the online viewers. Uh, all right, I've got to make Ollie smaller. There we go. See if it'll give me half the corner. Not letting me grab the corner. It will if I, there we are. Come on, there we go. All right, so up here you have the assembly code, and on the right side you have sort of C, uh, C code. Every time it calls a library function, it will give you the name of the library and something about it here, even the parameters, so you can really read almost the source code over there, which is pretty nice. And over here we have the registers, EAX, and here's the EIP standing out special. Down here we have the stack, and over here, you just have a hex dump that will dump anything you want to to look at it. And in the assembly code section, you've got the address of the, the code here. These are the raw hexadecimal bytes of the uh, binary machine code. This is the assembly code version intended to be more human readable. And this is the most readable stuff with the name of the library calls that are being made. So that's the basic layout of Ollie. And 
So we talked about this. Now, if you want to modify code in a disassembler window, you can press space bar and then change the code to something else. You can modify the registers or the stack, and you can make a memory dump of any part of it at any time to examine regions of memory. All right, and then you can view the memory map, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it'll show you all the memory being used, a very process. Let me try it for this one here. If I view memory map, memory, all right, you see various regions here. And uh, so here is something with some kind of PE is running here with these things, CG, wow, I don't really know what it is. Here's some app help, that looks like a DIL. Here's kernel base, I think that's also a DIL. Kernel 32 is a DIL, NT DIL. These are all the libraries loaded at various memory locations, and they're all portable executable, so they all have things like text and data and resource and relocation. And someplace in this mess will be the actual program that I'm running, which is this one. It's 000, that's right. The name of this program is 000. So it has funny looking segments, but it's written in raw assembly code. And, but anyway, it does have imports, code, and data with strange names for the section. But that's, you see the, how the memory is used. You can also see the permissions on memory. Mm -hmm. These are all read-only. This is read-write, and, and here's read-write-execute over here. So that's access, and uh, I'm not quite sure about the difference between these, but read-write-execute for all these, which um, and read-write-execute for all them, which is pretty foolish. Initial. But I mean, it has to be executable when you run it. So anyway, you can see something about permissions there. I feel like I... I don't understand the difference between those columns. I'd probably Google it if, uh, to get the details of that. But anyway, that's the uh, memory map. And we'll be playing with all these things a lot as we go ahead. So, all right, uh, now a module, before address space layout randomization, which is up through Windows XP, modules would just load at their preferred address. And you would specify in the header where it wants to load in memory, and it would just load there. Now, Microsoft added address space layout randomization in Windows Vista and later to try to change, to make it harder to hack these machines. And therefore, those machines would have to have a relocation section. The compiled executables that have a relocation section are called position independent executables, and they support address space layout randomization. So they do rebase every time you load them. They move to a different address. And rebasing is moving things to a different location where they want to be. Now, EXEs typically all want to load at 400,000 and they will load at a virtual address of 400,000, but they're not really at 400,000 in memory. So DILs are more commonly relocated because an application may import a lot of DILs. Now Microsoft writes its DILs, each DIL has a different base address to avoid this. But third-party DILs often just use the same preferred address. And frankly, on a modern system, I don't think it matters because everything is randomized anyway. But anyway, here's the problem. You'll have code like this, movie AX compare something. Here's a jump, not zero, but this is a relative jump, jumping back to some address that's just a little bit higher. So this is not using that literal address. This is just going to say jump back by about 10 bytes. But this is going to refer directly to this address, explicit address, which is part of the code. So if you relocate this in memory, you're going to have to change the code here, and that's what's in the relocation section all the individual instructions that have hard-coded addresses that must be changed when you relocate it. And therefore, loading it at an address other than the preferred address is technically slower and, and uh, uses up some CPU time, although not a lot. So that's, the, that's what happens when you rebase things. And those are the fix-up locations in the relocation section. All right. Um, and if things are rebased, then you can't predict where they're going to go, of course, and that's the point. Um, so you'll see, for example, if you open some, here's some device metadata parsers.dil, one of the, something in system 32, and as you can see, it has a relocation section. Almost everything now has a relocation section because um, uh, you'd have to have code that was so old it was written for XP uh, or code that was deliberately made, not rebasable. Everything is intent, supposed to be reloc uh, supposed to be cooperating with ASLR now. There are usually a few system modules on Windows machines that don't, though, and that's how people hack in. Um, you take the 127 class next semester, we'll do it. You hack into modern Windows machines by finding a module that doesn't have the modern protections. And even in modern machines, some of them don't because they mess up other things. So when they put in these protections, they can't really make them universal for everything. And you just have to attack the modules that don't have those protections yet. So you can remove the relocated from a DIL file and then it cannot be relocated. It can only load at its preferred base address. Um, that would make it load faster, but it will also mean it'll fail to load sometimes when it can't get there. 
All right, so he, for example, if you're on a machine without ASLR and both these modules want to load at 100 million, then the first one to load will get 100 million and the second one will have to get rebased to somewhere else, even though it would rather be at 100 million. All right, IDA Pro, by the way, which we haven't started using yet, but it's the alternative, a disassembler, IDA Pro does not run the software. It doesn't load the software. It just examines it, so it doesn't know about rebasing. So if you use Ali Debug and IDA Pro at the same time, you might see things loaded at different addresses because the real running code will be in one location and IDA Pro will be in another. So that can often confuse you if you compare them and uh, just have to be aware of it. You can specify the ba virtual base address manually in IDA Pro to get around that. The other thing, which I'll demonstrate later in the project, is you can take a relocation section out of stuff you're analyzing so it just loads where it ought to be <laughs> to make it easier to analyze. All right, you can, by the way, view threads individually in Ali Debug. Um, programs typically have multiple threads, and these are parts of the program that can move forward independently. Um, I've never had to do this. I've never worked with that kind of complicated code. I'm not sure that I've known any multi-threaded malware, but anyway, you can analyze thread by thread inside the debugger, uh, but I've never had to do that. And it, each thread has its own stack because each thread can move forward independently, <coughs> so it can get pretty complicated. So address space layout randomization, according to this last year, um, there are some limitations in ASLR, and in, in sandboxed environments like JavaScript, People say it's pretty hard to implement address space layout randomization, so code running in a browser is not randomized, and they're saying future defenses should not rely on it. By the way, ASLR is not as strong a defense as you'd think it is. Um, one of the huge problems with ASLR is that Microsoft did not put enough randomness in it. The first version only had 256 possible locations. It only randomized one byte, so one simple solution to overcome it was to just run your attack 300 times until you get lucky. Um, and so on. So I mean, it's, it's slowed down a generation of attacks, but it's not as strong as other defenses. So it's one of many defenses, but there's other ones a lot more powerful. So uh, to run code in the debugger, the most common thing you do is F9 to run your code um, or run debug run. You can pause it with F12. I've never used this because the code runs so fast. Pausing it while it's running is kind of nuts. Um, you can run to a selection, just click a line in the assembly code will run to there. Um, F9 will run, of course, to a breakpoint. The only thing that will stop it. You can run until return to get out of the function you're in. You can run until user code. This sounds very useful. I probably should use it more often than I have, Alt F9, which if you're stuck somewhere in the Microsoft libraries, it will run until it gets out of there back into user space. Uh, step into and step over I use all the time. The ones I use all the time are F7, F8, and F9. F7 will just go to the next instruction, whatever it is, F8 will go to the next instruction at this level, but if you're on a call instruction, it will go into the call routine, finish everything, until you get back to this level. And F9 will just run until it hits something to stop it, either a breakpoint or a prompt for user input or something. So that's the main stuff. F, the only things I really use are F2, F7, F8, and F9. F2 to set breakpoints and clear them. And F7, F8, and F9 to run through code. Is there, is there another mode that's similar to step over, except you bypass, you bypass uh, subroutine calls and you just put in whatever uh, dummy return values that you want? No, there isn't. And the question is, is there a way to jump over subroutines without executing them? That's what I thought this did first. No, it doesn't have anything like that, where it, it guesses the values. You either run the code or you don't. Now, you could manually modify the code or the registers, but there's no automatic process that will fake it. So, all right, so uh, you can run a program and hit pause when it's where you want to be, and that would only make sense for something like a game where you can see something moving on the screen and have some idea where you want to stop, but it's pretty sloppy. Breakpoints are much better if you can do it. Um, run and run to selection, I talked about. Run will just run. Uh, run to selection will run until it gets to the line you've highlighted and stop before it goes there, so it's just a way of uh, setting a single-use breakpoint easily. And uh, you can execute till return. This will go until you return from the current function. Of course, sometimes there is no return from the current function. Now, in proper software, there always would be, but malware often breaks the rules and does dirty tricks. So, um, and execute till user code. This will go until you get back to user land, and that would be fine. Typically, you're back into the text section. And F7, we talked about single step, step over. And uh, so if you step over, it might freeze on you because it might never come back from that subroutine call. 
and then you, you'll have to reload your program and to try again. I often have to reload stuff again and again. Once you will fall off the track and a bad thing happens, just reload it and start over. So let's try a Kahoot. And that should be all right. Yes, all right. Which objects are never rebased? Yep, if it doesn't have the relocation section, it can't be rebased. Yeah, they're on what I suppose is out.rebase, which is not a real thing. Yeah. All right, so which key press modifies a line of assembly code? In Ollie, of course. I do use this one. How do you step over? That's it, F8, good. All right, and how do you run until user code? By process of elimination, I know what these are. <laughs> anyway, all right. Breakpoints are the main reason you use these things, really. So software, hardware, conditional, and breakpoints on memory are all available. F2 adds or removes the software breakpoint, the kind you normally use. So you can view them 
uh, view breakpoints, there's also a button on the toolbar B that will show them to you, and you'll see your breakpoints down here, and you see they're labeled as int3, because that's what they are. They're CC in assembly language, or int3 instructions. And so, software breakpoints, you use F2, that's mostly what you use all the time. That will break when it tries to execute that instruction. You can make a conditional breakpoint, a hardware breakpoint, memory access breakpoint, or memory breakpoint on write. Those are all other options available to you. Uh, if you close Ollie, it will save your breakpoints. When you open the same file again, it will reload the breakpoints. And actually, it'd be kind of fun to see where it puts that. It must save another file somewhere. Uh, probably a way to find it and delete it, but I don't know what it is. By the way, that's true of uh, most reverse engineering tools. It's also true of Ida Pro. It will save all your work because it figures you might spend a week working on something, figuring it out, and you don't want to lose all that. So software breakpoints are useful, of course, the main one you normally use. So for example, if you have some encoded stuff and then it calls the decoder, then you would just put a breakpoint towards the end of this subroutine and you'll see the stuff after the decoder has run. That's one common way to deal with it. Um, right, and then you'll, it'll be on the stack. After the decoder is run, you'll be able to read it. Of course, you'll only reveal strings as they're used that way. So that's the limitation. Web dynamic analysis in general, you only get to see what's really happening. Um, oh, good. Okay. Ah, yeah, you're welcome, Tommy. All right. So, here's an example for the poison ivy was a backdoor. It was a rootkit used for a long time, and it would help it would allocate memory to hide the shell code. And so they'd make a conditional breakpoint on the virtual alloc function, which is a kernel function used to allocate memory. But they don't want to trigger every time you allocate memory. They only wanted to do when um, when you, when you, if you put a standard breakpoint there and see it hit, then this is what you'll see on the stack. It will have called a virtual alloc. It will have an address, size, allocation type, and protection value. You read and write and execute. Uh, this is execute, read, write. And so those are the parameters. So what you can do is you can um, specify ESP plus 8 greater than 100. And that will refer to um, this size parameter here starting ESP plus 8. So you can say only break when you're allocating more than 100 bytes of memory to avoid false positives. And therefore, what it'll really do is break every time it hits, then evaluate this thing, and then hit F9 for you if it's not right. So the end result is you'll only stop at the call that uh, can attach that satisfies that condition. All right. Now, the least software breakpoints do overwrite code in memory. They put CC on top of that byte in memory and remembers in the, de in the debugger what should be there and replaces it when you continue. And that means any part of your code that examines other parts of the code may detect that and run badly or notice you've done it wrong. So the alternative is hardware breakpoints. In the processor, there's room for four breakpoints and those will stop at these addresses without modifying anything in the code. The processor itself will know to stop there. So it's an option available. Um, all right, it's, and you can uh, have your software or hardware memory breakpoints. Now, normally you put breakpoints in the uh, uh, assembly code instructions to stop on a certain instruction, but you might want to stop somewhere else. Like, for example, you might find a string, and you want to stop whenever it tries to print that string, and you don't know where the instruction is, so you can just put a access memory breakpoint on the string, and whenever anything tries to read or write to that string, it will, um, will trigger. So that's another option. You can only have one memory breakpoint at a time, and it actually is pretty complicated for Ollie Debug to do this. It does some kind of unreliable things. It has to change the attributes of that memory block. So it's not terribly reliable. It has a lot of overhead. I don't know exactly how it does it, but what I'm thinking is it, um, yeah, I see good. People have a good answer for why it's the second one. It's the second parameter is ESP plus 8. Good. People figured it out. But the, um, the way I think you would do it is you would put block access. So it raises an exception every time you access that block. And then every time it happens, examine to see if it's the right one. And that would slow you down. And that's probably what they were just driving here. It has to do something pretty nasty to implement that. So it's not something you would use unless you have to. And you can see, for example, when a DIL is used, you can bring up the text section and set memory breakpoint and access. And then it'll break whenever your execution ends up anywhere in that DIL. That sounds pretty harmless. Should work pretty well. Anyway. So that's uh, the second bit here. Let's try another Kahoot. 126.9b.
fingers like maybe I got everybody that's coming. Okay, what's the most common break point? Software, software execution breakpoint. That's the most common type. All right, what kind of breakpoint is limited to only one instance? The breakpoint on memory. All right. What key press sets a breakpoint? F2, good. All right, and what kind of breakpoint is limited to no more than four? breakpoints in the processor. All right. <laughs> All right. Those people have to tell me who they are if they want points. I know who you do, so that's your name I recognize. All right. So, if you're loading a dill, um, it can't be loaded directly, so Ollie will use a dummy program, loaddill.exe, to load it, and then it'll break at dill main. Dill main, every time you load a library, the first thing it does is it runs dill main, and um, dill main prepares all the libraries for use. As soon as it's first loaded, it's run. So you'll have to press play to run dill main to prepare it. So let me try this. And in fact, when I did, now that I wrote this demo for Windows 2016 server, and I'm doing it on a Windows 10, so the steps are just a little bit different. But let me just put it here, and I can do it in my machine. It works. All right, so here I am, and uh, that's Ollie. So I'll close this, and I'm going to open this program, C Windows SysWow WS232.dil. What this is, is a 32 bit networking library loaded on a 64-bit machine. That's why it's in the SysWow 64. Windows on Windows 64 is the Microsoft um, framework to run 32-bit code on a 64-bit machine. So when you load it, it's going to warn you. It is, oh, another process is active. I'll terminate the old process. That's fine. And then it would, I think it remembered from before, I told it, go ahead and load it with run dill. So here it is. This is the main thread of the dill. There's the code. Here's the stack. And there's the registers. Now, um, all right, so let's click debug dill export to see what programs are executed are exported by this dill. And when I did it on server 2016, this thing was empty until I actually ran it once to run dill main. I didn't have to do that here, perhaps because some program is already using this library. I'm not really sure why I didn't have to run it. But here are all the functions. You got a lot of them, accept, bind, connect, and get uh, various functions, get sock something. These are the Ber Berkeley standard networking libraries that form the internet. This is Microsoft's implementation of those standard networking libraries. This is how, all, this is how all raw sockets work. So you can bind to a socket, you can accept data, and so on. Uh, that's what's going on. This is simple. Oh, it does go all the way back. This is the original. Wow. Yeah, that's what everybody has it. Python has it. Every language has this, and this is what they're all using. Um, some implementation of the BSD stuff. So now I can run one of these, and there's one that is particularly easy to run um, called N2HL. So let me find that one. This is just about the simplest networking library you could find, which is why I'm using it for demonstration. What this does is take a word and convert it from network order to um, little Indian order. That's what it does. So you can feed in a parameter, and it remembers what I typed in last time. The parameter I typed in is 7F000001. That is 127001 in 
hex. And that is the way you'd write this, but this will convert it to little Indian order. So when you run this with call, it will run and it will return in EAX the answer 01000007F. All it does is reverse the order of the bytes. But that's something you have to do. And you know, if you take the exploit development class, we do it a lot. Um, it's this little Indian thing means you very often have to do this transformation. So anyway, that just shows how you can run one function in a DIL in the debugger if you want to. It's kind of a lot of bother, and I've never had to do it in real combat, but it is an option. Anyway. Um, all right. So then there's tracing. Um, and I'll just demonstrate a few of these in a minute. There's backtrace, call stack traces, and run trace. This is how you analyze how did we get to this point. Um, all right. So standard backtrace works like this. Let me just demonstrate it. Um, if I have something here, I'm going to load a uh, program that we'll play more with later. The 000 is a very simple assembly language program. All right. And so this is the one with puts and scan F. So if I want to move forward, I can use F7 to take a single step. And it's not listening to me for some reason. F7. Hmm. All right. Um, debug. Step into. There it goes. Now we're going to take an F7. Maybe I got to hit function F7. Ah. Yep. That's function F7. Okay. So let me, you know, as I often do, when bad things happen, I don't know where I am, so I'm going to debug restart. This will get me back to a clean start. Now what happened here is I got a push and then a call. So if I hit F7 here, it's going to go into that call. So anyway, I can step forward. I'm just going to use F8 instead, so I don't go into the function. I'm going to do F8. Uh, click here. And function F8. There we go. So forward, and notice when I move forward, the registers will change, like EIP will certainly change. I'll do F8 again. There, see the EIP is changing. So if you want to go back where you were, you can just hit a minus sign, and it will move back, but the registers do not change. So the only point of that is you can see where you came from, but you cannot really turn the clock back with like an undo, like in Microsoft Word. That's what a standard backtrace is. It just lets you see where you came from, but it does not let you see what was happening at that point in time. All right. Um, and that's because to do more would be pretty expensive, but it is an option. You can do minus or plus to just see where you came from. Now, you can do a call stack at any time, and let's try a couple of them. So here, if I do a call stack right now, um, which is a debug call stack, um, let me check my instructions. View call stack. View call stack. OK. This shows the layers of calls. And right now, I'm only one layer deep, called from kernel. I'm in some function that was called from the kernel. So that's not too bad. But let's move in. Now I'm going to move forward with F7, because F7 will step into. So if I do F7, um, that takes me to scan F. Now I'm going to go into scan F. So now I'm somewhere in Microsoft's code running scanf, and now the call stack should be deeper. And as you see, here is the kernel. Kernel called this, and there's the, the parameter it passed in. So now I've moved into another layer deep, dream within a dream. So that's what the call stack is, is all, where are you now? I'm running this routine, which was called from this routine, which was called from that routine. That's where I am. I am partway through several routines at once. This one did a call, that one did a call. And when I return, so if I move forward here, um, if I do say, uh, I could do run till user code. Let's try that. Is that debug? Execute till user code. Let's do that. That should get me back. Not obvious that it did. Not obvious that it did anything at all. EIP is 753. Let's try it. Debug run till user code. Ah. OK, it won't let me do it anymore. All right, let's see what F7 does anything. All right, I seem to have hit some kind of bad spot. I'm just going to set it up again with debug restart. All right, and so now if I, I just wonder if I can do that. If I do F7 a few times, I should get into puts. And now I should be able to run till user code. I've never used this. I can execute till return. That should work. There's the return. If I do an F7 here, that takes me back to where I was. Okay, anyway, so now the call stack will be small again. That's all I wanted to see. 
um, view call stack. Yeah, now it's back being small again. I moved down and moved back up. All right, that's enough of that. You see the basic idea? All right. And so, uh, yeah, I already demonstrated some of this. Yep, you step into things and the call stack gets deep, and when you come back, it's uh, less deep. All right. When you return, it gets short again. And here's the kind of call stack you'll find with other code really, really deep. Let me move this up so the slide is easier. See, it can get really deep. You know, you can be 14, 20 layers down in a, normal, in a more complicated program. Um, there's really no limit until you run out of memory. All right, and the thing that you would probably like, if I'm used to using Microsoft Word, which I was, Microsoft Word, you can just do undo all the way back. You can just play it back like a movie, which is awesome, but that's expensive, of course. Let's see. Um, let's see, I see some questions going by. Expensive in terms of what? Memory? Uh, yes, you have to remember everything. Database. Yes, you're gonna have to keep a database of all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's, but it, it does have that option. But, but not in terms of money. No, 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 just, you know, just, uh, yeah, just expensive in terms yeah. of memory consumption. Yeah, anyway, so now let's try run trace. You can do it the other way. You can do it where it does remember everything. So let's uh, do debug restart again to get a clean setup here. And now I can do a run trace if I just select all the lines, like I can select the entire function all the way down to here. That's pretty much all the code in this simple thing. And then right click, um, check my instructions. After right click, run trace, add selection. Okay. Let me try it again. I got to select it first. Okay, let's be a little bit more careful selecting it. Debug restart. Whenever I get lost, I do a debug restart. Okay. Starting there, shift down, we'll select some stuff. That's enough. I don't need it all. Right click. Run trace, add selection. Okay, now it's gonna remember everything here. So now if I do F8 for a while, function F8, you can see EIP is changing and other registers are changing. And now if I hit minus, it's gonna go back and it's gonna change all the registers back. Now it memorizes everything you do so you can roll back and forth. And you don't wanna just do this all the time because it would slow you down. You do it for the part you really want that functionality on. So that's cool. All right. And so I did that, we've seen that. Okay, you can step back with minus and forward with plus. All right, you can trace into and trace over as well. Um, there's some buttons up here. These little buttons here are trace into and trace over, I think. I never use them, but they're there. All right, this is another way to do it besides add selection. You can keep running the trace as you move. All right. Um, Fair enough. And of course, it might end up trying to trace the entire program, which if it's a big program, might be slow and use up all your memory. All right. Uh, you can trace until a condition hits. You have proper your EIP is in range, other things. Um, let's see, I don't quite understand that option. Um, yeah, this one here, uh, I don't quite understand it either. I haven't used it. You trace into something, so you try to trace as you move. And then you move into a subroutine and try to trace what happens inside there. Um, I'm not quite sure how it would work. You have to play with it to see. I'm, I'm the same as you. I don't entirely understand it, and I've never used any of this stuff. But the options are there if you have a fancy problem. And you could even trace until some condition. So this would uh, look for certain conditions, EIP in a range and so on. Um, all right. All kinds of fancy stuff is in there, but I've only used the basics. Now, exceptions are important. So you have exceptions if you try to divide by zero, if you do anything illegal, like you try to execute kernel code from user land, or you try to execute code in a region of memory that is marked non-executable, or you try to jump or read a piece of memory that is outside the memory allocated in the memory map for your program, all those will trigger an exception. So when that happens, um, it'll have the first chance to come to the debugger, an exception has happened. You can then do shift F7, to return the exception to the program to see if the programmer included an exception handler to deal with it. And if they didn't, it will come back to you a second time. And then you want to, if you pass it back again, the program will crash and Windows will pop up an error message because the program didn't handle it. So you have these options. You can step into the exception, step over it, or run the exception handler. The most common thing you do is Shift F9 
to resume execution because you don't care about the first chance exception. All right. And they often aren't important in malware analysis, but sometimes bad guys do use exceptions to get to their code. And so then you can patch code, and we're going to do quite a bit of this next class. Um, you can do binary edit. You can just right-click, assemble. Binary edit to change the contents of memory to anything you want. You can right-click, assemble to type in assembly language instructions, which will then put on top of the instructions that are there. And this is what the space bar does, too. That's why assemble has space. Space is the same thing as assemble. This yeah? way you can step over the function, right? Yeah, this is one way. So yeah, this one here, for example, um, if I, let me go back, debug, restart. This is the, the next, the project I'll do next time. Uh, you cheat on this game. So if you have uh, some code you don't want to, here's a jump not, ze not zero. This is checking some input to see if you got it right. It's comparing it to something and then jumping if I get it wrong. So to get rid of that, I just hit space and then type in NOP. And now it'll replace all that code with NOP. And now I can go down here. I say, assemble, 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 and do it here too. There, now, it is not going to compare what I put into something and not jump somewhere and just go here. This is how you can cheat at a game or skip over many things. For example, the example in your book is you have malware that checks, am I in an English-speaking country? If so, do nothing. Only attack if I'm Chinese. Well, you could just knock out that stuff so it does the bad stuff even though you're not in the region it was going to attack. So yeah. To save, yeah, you typically, would, I, I would save this as a separate executable. Um, you could run it right now in the debugger, um, but I would save it so you can do it, go back and do it later. That's well, I, I prefer to always save it because I often make mistakes and I have to go back a few steps and try again. So that's how you modify. That's binary edit, and you can also edit any block of memory. You can go down here and like if I don't want it to say something about the dog. I can change this dog to be something else. Right click, binary edit. There, I can change that to um, cat. There. Now it'll print a message about a cat instead of a dog. Yeah, you can change anything. That's the point of a debugger. You can change parameters, you can change registers, you can change anything you want. Is that how people write malware to begin with? Do they use debuggers? No, no, they don't write malware in a debugger. What they do usually is write it in C and compile it, and then work from that. But yeah, C, you can write assembly with space. You can only write instructions the same length. Yes, that's a problem, of course. Yes, if you try to, you, it's going to overwrite as many bytes as you do. So if you put in a long instruction, that's why putting in a NOP is often best, because that's only one byte. But if you put in a long instruction that was five bytes, and there were, it will overwrite five bytes of the original code, which might break things. Yeah. Yeah, shift F9, you could do it on the first pass or the second pass. But if you do it on the second pass, the program's going to crash and you're just going to get a Windows error message. So normally you only do it on the first pass with exceptions. Which of the options, shift F7 or F9, is equivalent to ignore the exception? Um, well, none of them will ignore the exception. Uh, there is no way to ignore an exception. Uh, all you're deciding is whether you want to resume execution, which will consist of processing the exception. I don't think there's any way to ignore the exception. Why when do you think that when you handle the exception, you only, uh, it works in the first time? You only what? Only the first time? Yeah, because the first exception is just informing you that an exception happened, but exceptions do not mean anything is wrong. There could be an exception, which then goes to a handler, and it's okay. But it gives you a chance to intervene in case you care, because the point is you're debugging code, and the exception might be bad. But it's really only a problem if it comes back a second time. Because that means an exception happened, and it was an unhandled exception. And an unhandled exception terminates your code and goes to the Windows operating system. And it just pops up a message. And you usually don't want to let that happen. I mean, then you lose control. You have to start over the program. So um, what about Shift F8 to step over? Yeah, I was just wondering about that. Um, I've not tried it. And I haven't got a good example to try it. You could be right. Shift F8 might step over. Um, yeah, it's um, step over the exception. Maybe that does ignore the exception and just go on to the next line as if it didn't happen. It's an interesting question, and I don't know the answer. Do you shift F8 over functions? Yeah, yeah. I, um, it's a good question. Shift F9 is what I always use, which resumes running and goes into the exception handler. Shift F7 would, of course, go in there and then stop. 
I don't know what shift F8 would do. It's a good question. Maybe shift F8 will just ignore the exception and increment as if it hadn't happened. That would be bizarre, but I, I don't really understand exactly what it does. These are good questions, but I don't have a good answer. All right, anyway, so um, like I say, you can fill something with not to skip instructions, and then you can save the patched code. You can just right click and save the file. Um, one dirty trick, which I'll mention next time too, but you might as well get it. If you want to save your modified code, you right click here and copy to executable all modifications. This is a lie. When it's, you do all modifications, it, notice how I changed two things. I changed the cat and I changed the nops. It's only going to change the nops and not the cat. When it says all modifications, what it means is all modifications in this segment. If I right click here, this is the text segment, and it'll save all modifications I made to the text segment. This is a data segment. If I've saved from here, it'll save the data, but it won't get the nops. You can't get them both. So after being very frustrated for a long time, I learned to just save it after each change. Otherwise, you can go mad. Would it, would it, if you save one in the code section and one in the address section? Then they will both be wrong. The one in the code would section... Come, would, it, would it come out into the same file? No. If this one will have only these changes and not those... No, 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 the same, when you save it to the executable, the executable file name will be the same? No, well, you can choose the file name, but they will both be wrong. Neither of them will have both of these changes. The only way to get these changes would be to save it here, then load that, then save it, and then modify this and save it again. Yeah, that's, that's what I found. So that's, that's the thing about hacking tools. The user interface and the descriptions are not quite perfect. Anyway, and so there's a technique in your book to analyze shellcode. If you write your own shellcode, which is shell code to take over a box, then you can analyze shell code. There's various ways to do it. The most easiest way to do it that I always do is just write a C program around it. But you can actually load shell code directly in the um, debugger and run it in there. I'm not sure why you would do this, but you could put your binary code directly in the debugger and run it sort of naked. Um, it seems like the hard way to me. It's easier to just write a C shell around it. But anyway, you can have a region of zeros put in your shell code and then just put the EIP at the start of your shell code and run it. Um, all right. There's a log that shows everything you did to get to a certain place. So here it shows a console file, new process, main thread, this module loaded, that module loaded, and so on. Shows everything that was loaded as it loads all the libraries and such. Uh, there is a watch window where you can watch the value of an expression to see when it changes, if there's something of interest to you. Um, you can label things. You can mark subroutines and loops and functions and such with useful descriptive names as you figure out what they do. Um, which one is the best way to write shell code? Um, well, we, we do it a little bit of it in 127. Um, writing shell code is pretty difficult. What I do is just use Metasploit to write my shell code. However, that's because I'm a wimp. If you really want to write shell code, what you do is you write C code and compile it. Well, first you can just write it directly in assembler. But usually you write C code and compile it, and then you clean it up in assembler. Because the problem is you have to get all the null bytes out of it. So you have to go back in assembly and change a lot of the instructions because many instructions have embedded null bytes and you have to avoid all that. <coughs> so there's a, there's a book, the Shell Coders Handbook, that shows you how to do it. And we do a little bit of it in the uh, exploit development class, but not too much. These are good questions. All right. And so then there's plugins. You can extend Ollie Debug. It is like Firefox. You can add extensions and plug them in. So there's some that come with it, like we'll use Ollie Dump. We used it last time. This dumps a debug process. There's one that tries to hide it from debugger detection, which might fool some malware. You can control it from the command line. Um, I wouldn't bother. I would just use WinDebug if you're going to do that. And their their bookmarks are included by default to bookmark memory location. You can have you can make marks to take you back to memory location. I should probably use that more often than I do. And then you can script the debugging. The immunity debugger which remember is the later thing based on Ollie Debugger, it uses Python script and has an API so you can write scripts to automate debugging sessions. And they write custom scripts that do things. Um, and there's people that have written these and made them publicly available to do things like uh, decrypt encrypted stuff and do complicated things like that. Again, I've never used any of them, but it is an option, the sky's the limit. So let's do the last Kahoot. Good, we're right on time here. I just need to find my cahoots. There they are. Uh, this is 9C. There we go. They've 
animated that, so it's hard to click. Anyway, it's a free product, though. Can't complain too much. What's that? Well, they say that, but they're not enforcing it because I must have been grandfathered in. Because I've been using it for years, so. Your college may have, or your school may have an account. Yeah, but I think yeah, you're down to only 10 or 8 if you're new accounts. I've been using it for a long time, so I appear to have gotten grandfathered into a free account with no limit. But they might turn it off at any moment. Then I'll have to pay them something. One time I wrote my own version of it for some reason, but it's not as cool. It doesn't have the cool music. It's easy enough to write your own in PHP, but it's not as much fun. I think the college has an account, though. I could probably use it for free through that. Anyway. That might be what I do if, uh, if they actually start limiting me. Okay, if you press the minus sign, what are you doing? That's a back test. You just go back to see where you came from. Which, by the way, would be a more professional thing than what I do all the time, just debug restart because I'm lost. Going back to see where I came from would be a slicker way to handle the problem of getting lost. All right. What feature lets you step back and see previous values? That's run trace. All right. Okay, what feature will show all the functions that are waiting for execution to resume? That's the call stack trace. All right. All right, which feature shows you all the modules that were loaded to get you to where you are? Stop this video.